Okay, I, wa I want to uh, introduce to you first uh, the other Jason Rosenfeld, um, the Jason Rosenfeld of StatDNA, who is going to introduce the next speaker. So uh, please welcome uh, Jason Rosenfeld of StatDNA. Hi. Um, I just wanted to give a, a two-second introduction to our company and, and the competition we ran, and then I'll introduce Sarah, who is the winner of the StatDNA research paper competition. Um, so SatDNA is a startup company. We've been around for nearly two years, and the objective of the company is to collect and analyze uh, very advanced sports data. Um, and we've started uh, in the sport of soccer, uh, particularly because it's um, one of the sports where people complain that there's the least data to, to analyze. Um, the idea behind the competition was there are a lot of uh, great researchers who are interested in soccer and bloggers as well, many of whom are here today. And the common complaint was, uh, well, we don't have any data to analyze. So, so we thought, well, let's, let's release some data and see what kind of ideas we get out of it. And so we released, uh, on each game we collect about 15 to 20,000 pieces of data manually. Um, we rela released a data set of about 300 uh, ma uh, matches uh, from the Premier League and from uh, the Brazilian First Division. And we got about 80 uh, requests for the data, which I was, I was getting very worried uh, about having to read 80 research papers. So um, thankfully, uh, uh, there, you know, for us, I guess, uh, about uh, five people finished research papers, which we thought was a good number. Um, and Sarah was the winner of the competition. Um, you'll also see a couple more posters today based on, on the data as well. Um, so to introduce Sarah, um, she was born and raised in Concord. I didn't know that. Um, so she's basically a native. Uh, she studied computer science at Columbia University and has her MBA from the University of Washington. Uh, by day, she's a software engineer for Bing, where she gets to play with big data. And by night, she is the founder of On Football Research and Consulting. Um, you've probably seen her blog, onfooty.com. A lot of you, it's a great blog with a lot of interesting analysis. Um, she's a lifelong soccer player. Her obsession hit new heights after she attended her first match in 1993. Uh, the US defeated England 2 to 0. As a result, she hopes to see this again in her lifetime. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, so just first off, I'm not an academic. Um, I don't have a PhD in statistics. Um, so I don't think this is going to be quite as technical as some of the previous talks. Um, but here we go. So. Statistical analysis for soccer is a fairly new field, um, so there are lots of unanswered questions. Um, so some of the questions that I wanted to answer are, how valuable are certain game situations? Um, how do these values vary across teams, and what can we learn from that? Um, and then can we quantify how much a player contributes to creating good goal-scoring opportunities? Um, so individual assessment is like a really, really tough uh, problem in soccer because it's such a team-focused uh, sport. So why is this hard? Well, it's hard to capture all of the information about the game state. Um, in soccer, off the ball movement is just as import important as on the ball movement. Um, so with a lot of data sets, they just give you uh, the touch by touch data. And so what was sort of unique about StatDNA's data set is that they give you some defensive information, which is great. Um, there's sparse data. So we haven't seen all of the possible ways that a game situation can develop. Um, so how do we sort of create a model that can sort of account for that? Um, and those that we have seen, we only have a few data points. Um, and then how do you divide up credit? How do you say, OK, this person scored a goal, but it was a team effort. Um, how can we fairly credit people for you know, giving the, the passes that led up to that goal? So I decided to use Markov chains. Um, so if Keith Goldner is here from Drive By Football, uh, he has a really, really great um, series of blog posts on drive-by football that go into these in much better detail than I could ever explain. Um, so if you have any uh, questions about it, I would recommend talking to him. Uh, he has a poster about this. Um, but I'll do my best. So what do they do? They model the outcomes um, of a, like all the possible outcomes that you could get after a number of iterations based on transitioning from one state to another. Um, so <clears throat> if you know the probability of going from state A to state B, you can sort of then figure out what's the probability of going from state A to your final state. Um, so for my research, I had two final states, either the possession ends or you score a goal. Uh, so why are they useful? They allow us to look at all of the different ways that a possession can unfold. Um, 
And then because of these absorbing states, the goal or end of possession, uh, you can handle arbitrary length possessions really nicely. So the downside to Markov chains is that they assume that the current state is independent from all of the previous states. Um, so it doesn't matter how we got here, um, the probability of the next move is going to be the same regardless. So this is a, a, an assumption that I sort of struggled with when doing my research. Um, and if we didn't have the defensive data, um, I don't think you could make this assumption. If you were just looking at, okay, I have the ball in this part of the field, um, where is it gonna go next? Uh, but because we have this defensive data, you can sort of make this assumption a little bit better and say, okay, I'm on a, a counterattack. It doesn't matter that this counterattack is the result of a corner kick or, um, you know, an intercepted back pass. Like, let's just say we're on a counterattack and move forward. So the data set. So StatDNA gave us touch-by-touch um, -touch data. So we have the position on the field, the XY data, an event type, which is, you know, shot, pass, corner kick, tackle, foul. Um, the defensive pressure, so um, whether or not a player is open when they have the ball, whether they're being pressured, being closed down, and then the defensive state. Um, so if you think about the space on the field that a team is sort of occupying defensively, um, they gave us data about whether the whole team is sort of behind the ball, and you have to sort of get your way through all of them, whether you're somewhere in the middle or whether you're completely in behind the defense. Um, and so this was really, really helpful. Um, the data that I used is just from the English Premier League um, for last season. So we had about 123 matches. Um, each team had a, a minimum of 11 matches, although some of them had as many as 25. Um, and there were about 100,000 data points that I used. These are deliberate actions that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so that's about 800 actions per match that we were able to use. So in order for the Markov chain to work, I had to define different states. So I have my two absorbing states, goal or end of possession. So end of possession is either it, the ball gets returned to the other team or the game, or the half ends. Um, I also had seven set pieces, so I called out set pieces uh, specifically because of the unique way that both teams sort of get to um, sort of reset up and reorganize. And they're usually practiced a lot on the training ground. Um, so they're fairly unique. And then uh, I had 30 different states defined by a zonal location and the defensive states. So those two pairs of, um, you know, where you are in the field and then what does the defense look like. So 39 total states. So these are the set pieces that I um, called out specifically. So penalty kicks are obviously um, pretty unique. Uh, and then I divided up short and long corners, short kick, free kicks, long free kicks. Um, and then I looked at throw-ins as well. And this was because I wanted to sort of look at um, how do tactics come into play? Is there a difference between taking a, a corner short, as in passing it to a teammate nearby, or long, which is crossing it into the box and trying to score uh, that way? So these are the zones that I used. Um, originally, I wanted to have a very fine-grained uh, way of dividing up the field, um, but you need a lot of data to do that. So with 39 states, I have uh, 1,500 different transitions. Um, so if I had divided this up into you know, 100 different regions, um, it just would have been out of control. Um, so I had to think of a smart way to sort of divide up the field. Um, and so what I did was I looked at different characteristics of what's going on in the field in these different zones. So these are crosses under a different or under a, a certain type of defense, um, and you can see that they're falling pretty much um, into this final third of the uh, field, and then they're sort of in these outer bounds. So these are zones one, three, uh, four, and six. And then if you look at crosses where they got in a little bit more behind the defense, um, they're sort of clustered uh, in the deeper zones only. If you look at shots, again, they drop off significantly um, once you get outside of that final third. And then if you look at goals, they're almost completely confined within one small area. So a deliberate action, um, this is what I used to determine uh, what was actually gonna cause a transition. So it's any action where a player deliberately moves the ball in a controlled manner um, with an attempted outcome. 
So this is something like a pass or a shot, um, but I wanted to uh, ignore things like clearances or tackles where um, the player's not really in control and you couldn't really say that you know, his team has fully regained possession uh, of the ball. Um, and so sort of the motivation behind this is on a corner kick, if a team clears the ball out but it falls to you know, your defender, you still have that possession. And so I wanted to sort of credit that to the possession of corner kicks. Um, rather than saying, let's restart and count this as a new possession. Um, and so a possession is just any series of uh, deliberate actions, only interrupted by the other team getting possession or the end of the half. So once I had all those states, um, I needed to calculate my transition matrices. So I did this not just for the entire uh, league data, but I also did it for each individual team. Um, so I just looked at the probability of moving from state A to state B, did this for all 39 states, 1,571 elements. Um, and so you calculate your matrix like that. The absorbing, absorbing states are handled a little bit differently. Um, so once you move into an absorbing state, you don't want to move out. So you say, OK, possession ends when I score a goal. Um, so that row is uh, you know, a 1 for moving from that absorbing state to itself and 0 for all others. So if you multiply a transition matrix by itself, that'll give you the probability of ending up in a given state after one iteration. If you repeat this to infinity, um, it'll give you the probability of ending up in one of the absorbing states uh, after an infinite number of transitions. So I only used 20. Um, after about 20 different transitions, uh, the terminal probabilities were pretty much stabilized. So you get something that looks like this. Um, so for validation, um, I used bootstrapping. Uh, so I did uh, 1,000 samples with inline replacement. So basically, um, I wasn't replacing the events. I was replacing the transitions. So I just resampled that. And then I looked at the expected goals versus actual goals. Um, and I did a basic regression on that and got a really high R squared. Um, so I again tried it with k-fold validation um, and I got a pretty similar R squared. So it looks like these uh, transition probabilities are pretty good. So when you look at um, the, the probabilities of scoring from a given state for all of the teams, um, you come up with something that sort of looks like this. So the columns are the probabilities for each team and the rows are the probability for a given state. And they're ordered so that the, um, they're ordered based on where the team finished in last year's season. So all the way on the left, you have uh, Manchester United, who were the champions last year. And all the way on the right, you have West Ham United, who were relegated. So if you look at it, you can see there's a, you know, a fairly good trend that as you move down the table, it's a little bit harder for teams to score. Um, but what I thought was interesting is there's you know, two teams that sort of stick out um, in the third column. Uh, if you notice, the, the colors are a little bit darker red, which means lower probability. Um, and that's for Manchester City, and they had the best defense last year. So they're underperforming offensively, overperforming defensively. Um, and then the converse is true for Wolves, who are sort of in 17th, or that little green bar. Um, they had a pretty good offense, but their defense was absolutely terrible and almost got relegated. So if we look at the results, um, this is league-wide, the probability of scoring a goal from the different set pieces. So penalties are obviously um, really, really likely to score a goal. Um, looking at the difference between long corner kicks and short corner kicks, uh, there's a statistically significant difference between the two. And it's about a 35% more likely to score from a long corner kick than a short corner kick. Um, but that doesn't necessarily hold true for all teams. Um, so when I looked at how this plays out for uh, individual teams, you can see that Spurs are actually really good at short corners. Um, in fact, they're better than most teams are at long corners. Um, and then there are teams like Birmingham that are just bad no matter what. Um, and then you can, you can also look at the defensive probabilities of conceding from a corner kick. Um, so as an Arsenal fan, I'm sad to see that they're bad at corners, um, which is as expected. Uh, but Manchester United is worse at defending short corner kicks than they are at long corner kicks. So if you're Spurs and you're playing Manchester United, you can sort of say, okay, 
we're going to go for even more short corner kicks and sort of adjust your tactics that way, hoping to get you know, a little bit of an advantage. So you can also use a similar technique looking at counterattacks. So this is where you're sort of far away from goal, um, but you're in behind the defense. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any information about where the offensive teammates are, so we don't know if this is a you know, two on zero or a three on one sort of situation. Um, but we do know that at least you're in behind the defense. So you can sort of see, okay, teams at the top of the table, they're doing pretty well, Manchester United, Arsenal, Spurs, Chelsea. Um, most teams in the EPL fall within this gray band. They're sort of eh, between one and 3% chance of scoring. Um, but you can look at teams like Sunderland or Bolton and say, okay, even if these guys do get an opportunity to counterattack, they're gonna mess it up and they're not gonna score. So maybe I can take a few more risks. Maybe I can play with sort of a higher defensive line um, and sort of gain some advantages that way, knowing that you're gonna concede more counterattacks, but if you do concede a counterattack, it's not gonna matter much, hopefully, because uh, they're not very good at it. So now for the good stuff. This is the stuff that got me really, really excited, um, sort of applying all of these probabilities towards individual assessment. Um, so in soccer right now, uh, there are only a few statistics that are out there to sort of help people gauge um, how good a player is. So you have things like goals, completed passes, passing percentage. Um, right now, Barcelona, they're sort of the best team in the world. They're famous for their passes. So you'll see statistics like, okay, Javi, their midfielder, completed 160 passes, you know, 99%. Um, which is great, but not all passes are created equal. So, um, you know, a back pass, a square pass, or a through ball that puts your teammate one-on-one -on -one with the keeper are all sort of weighted equally, um, given these current metrics. Uh, personally, I'd rather have a through ball that puts my teammate one-on-one -on -one with the keeper. Um, that seems like it's gonna be more likely to help my team score goals. Um, and similarly with goals, uh, goal scorers are always credited um, with a one or a zero. Uh, if it's a tap-in, that's really easy. They didn't do much work. Their teammates did all the work for them, but they're getting all the credit. Um, and then uh, another problem is missed opportunities. They're showing up, well, they could show up uh, positively in the metrics. So if you miss a penalty, um, if it's saved by the keeper, this would be counted as a shot on target. Um, so it doesn't really reflect that you missed a 71% chance at scoring a goal. Um, so what I decided to do was weight each action that a player performs based on the incremental improvement on their team's probability of scoring a goal. So what does it look like? Well, so here's how it sort of works. So if you have player one in a state with a probability of scoring a goal of 0.25 and they pass it to a sort of less likely state, um, they're gonna get dinged um, with the difference of those two states. Um, if then player B passes it to player C, um, they'll get a little bit of a reward, but then player C who scores the goal, um, they get a lot of reward, um, but not the full one or zero. Uh, similarly, if player one earns a penalty, um, they get a huge reward for doing that, and then if player two misses the penalty, um, they get a huge penalty for that. So what I like about this is it also sort of gives you credit no matter what the outcome of your uh, teammate's next move is. So if they screw up, uh, you don't get penalized for that. So I calculated um, sort of the total net contribution for all players per match and came up with the top performers. Um, so the top performers are Tim Cahill, Yaya Toure, and Cesc Fabregas. Um, so if you watch a lot of soccer, this shouldn't be too surprising. Um, these guys are pretty good. Um, and I call out Jordan Henderson, uh, specifically in the top 25. So he's a young player. Um, he made a big money move to Liverpool this summer. Um, Liverpool is owned by John Henry. Um, so John Henry, good job. Uh, there were some surprises, like James Morrison, Ricardo Fuller, and Chris Baird. Um, they're in the top 25. They're not really household names. Um, I don't have a good reason for why they're showing up so well. Um, but what's nice is you can go back, you can sort of start digging into the data and looking at what situations are they getting most of the credit for and, and sort of what's happening. Is it that they're putting their teammates in good positions and they don't really have good teammates that are able to capitalize on that? Um, 
or are they just sort of, you know, uh, getting a little bit lucky? So if you look at the worst performers, um, which you can also do, you can see who is sort of destroying chances on your team. Um, there are lots of goalkeepers, uh, but also strikers and defenders. So goalkeepers are on here because um, you don't get any credit for moving the ball from the same state to itself. Um, so if a goalkeeper sort of passes the ball to their defender, it's probably going to be the same state, and they're probably not going to get any credit for that. But if they boot it downfield and it gets recovered by the other team, they're going to get penalized for that. So you expect to see sort of goalkeepers to have a negative net contribution. Um, but they can minimize this by um, not making so many 50-50 balls in the midfield and trying to move the ball out from the back. Um, poor Darren Bent, so he's by far the worst uh, performer. Um, he actually scored 17 goals last season, which is really, really good. Um, and he also had a big money move in January. Um, he cost the team 24 million pounds. Um, but in our sample set, he only had one goal out of those 17. So remember, we're only looking at about 11 to 20 uh, matches per team. Um, so maybe it's just unfortunate luck. But in the sample set, he also had a lot of opportunities to score. So there were 19 chances he had where the probability of scoring a goal was greater than 10%, and the average of those chances was 22%. So 19 chances, 22%, you expect him to score, I don't know, maybe about four goals, um, but he only scored one. Uh, so he's, he's uh, having a little bit of trouble there converting chances. Um, and then another thing uh, that I noticed is um, three guys, Klishi, Young, and Kolarov, they're all sort of uh, wingers, outside backs. They cross the ball a lot. Um, so perhaps they uh, have such a low negative contribution um, because they're just not very good at crossing the ball, or maybe crossing the ball isn't really the right strategy. Um, you're going to end up giving it back to the other team more than you are going to score a goal. Um, so you can dig into the, the data and really um, try to identify which situations are um, sort of accounting for why a player is performing so poorly or so well and try to figure out, you know, um, how can we adjust things and sort of get them to choose the right decisions during the game. All right. So thanks for listening, um, and special thanks to StatDNA for providing me with awesome data and this wonderful opportunity. We have, uh, we have some time for some questions. James? Yeah, so uh, you, you showed these numbers, but were these numbers per game? Those, those more of the, the minute probability and the goal probability that you had? Yeah, so for the individual player assessment, that's per match. That's per match? Yeah. Yeah, um, so uh, there are actually quite a few that sort of fell sort of into the middle range. Um, and one of the things that I want to do um, further is sort of look at the expected range of values per position. Because I think that um, goal scorers, strikers, tend to be penalized a little bit more because they're taking so many shots that results in returning possession to the other team. Um, so there weren't as many goal scorers in the top 25 as I was expecting. Like these games, you know, 123, are there kind of from the beginning of the season or are there spread out across the season? Because it's not all the games that do so, right? Yeah, so I believe it's a fairly random mix of games. Um, they were just trying to give us a sample of the games, um, but I don't think it was from a confined time period. So I didn't um, try doing wins. Uh, one of the reasons is I'm not sure uh, there's a very strong signal in soccer because of so many random 
factors, um, but that's definitely an area that I would like to pursue further on. Um, and then, sorry, what was the first question? Uh, so what was the average you're comparing to using that negative against Bucks? So I guess those are, I mean, like, is the average player at zero? Uh, that's actually something I didn't look at. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, that's a really good question. I didn't look at that. Um, overwhelmingly, teams take more long corners than short corners. Um, so that may well be the case that they're just better at it because they do it so much. I'm not sure. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. All right, let's, uh, let's stop here and thank the speaker again. Thank you. Okay, so we have, uh, we have a half hour break. There should be coffee, tea, and water outside. Uh, please plan to come back here at 1130 when we'll start our next session. So thanks.